Welcome everyone. This is History of Researching and Blister. Um, just wait a moment, make sure everyone is able to get in, set themselves up comfortably, turn on their cameras, mute themselves, take a sip of their Yorkshire tea. <laughs> All right. Okay. So lovely to see all your friendly faces. And I think we're good to get started. I am Livia Labati, and I am happy to welcome historian Jill Liddington. Uh, Jill requires little introduction to this audience as the author of wonderful books, Presenting the Past, Female Fortune, Nature's Domain, among many other works about Enlister and beyond. Hello, Jill. Hello. Very nice to uh, join you, Liv. Uh, very nice to have you. Um, so as we dedicate the next few days to researching Anne Lister's life and times, it seems fitting to start by discussing how that has evolved over the years. So uh, what has preceded us and how might we learn from the lessons of those that preceded us. Uh, so I, I asked Jill if we could travel back in time together and discuss what framed prior research endeavors and how that can shape our understanding of Anne Lister today so we can make good choices in the future as we try to understand her better. So Jill, uh, what do you feel is a good starting point to contextualize Enlister's life as we seek to understand her? Well, Livia, I think probably a good starting point is Halifax itself, because sadly, very sadly, a lot of people, particularly from America or Spain, had hoped to come to Britain and to, to Halifax this April, but we all know what happened. <coughs> So for people who haven't yet made the journey to Halifax, <coughs> I'm going to take you to the Peace Hall, grade one listed building, built just before Anne Lister was born. And we're standing there and we're looking up this very steep hill. We're looking from the Peace Hall down to Halifax Minster and then up this very steep hill. And at the top of the steep hill and just out of, uh, over the top of the hill, down into the next valley is Shipton Hall. And what that means is, Andister was hidden from the prying eyes of the citizens, people down in Halifax. What that meant in terms of living a lesbian life in Halifax in the 1830s is she could do much more of what she wanted to do. She had to be careful, she had to be respectable, she had to be decorous, but she could do quite a lot. <coughs> That's fantastic. Um, so if we, if we think about that context and, and we think about then with her untimely death, death in the 1840s, it would be many years before we see a first example of someone intentionally studying her diaries. And so can you tell us a little bit about that first researcher? Yes, certainly. I mean, Anne Lister, as you know, died in 1840 and died in remote West Georgia, which is about as far east as you could possibly go. And um, the people who have the family who eventually uh, inherited and moved into Shipton Hall in the 1850s was, of course, other branch of the Lister family, uh, indirect descendants of Anne. And the key person here is John Lister. He was very young. He was a young boy when he moved in with his family. And he then had quite an elite education. He went on to, he went to Winchester College, an elite public school for boys, and then Oxford University, Brasenose uh, College, and then trained to be a lawyer at the Inner Temple. So that's about as highly educated as you can go in Britain. Came back to Shipton and became really interested as a scholar, as a historian, as an antiquarian in the diaries that he found there, the Anne Lister diaries. And he was quite political, and it's interesting that his politics were developing in a different direction from Anne's. Um, his to the left, hers very much to the right. And he began writing a social and political um, history of Halifax um, earlier in the century from Anne's diaries, extracts of Anne's diaries, starting in 1887 and going on to 1892. And he didn't know the code then, 
he hadn't cracked the code at that point, but he was writing about what she did at election time and how she doorstepped her tenants with Anne Walker and some of the social and political life of Halifax in Anne Lister's lifetime. That's, that's really interesting. Do you have a sense of what the reception was locally to his early articles? I suspect they were, it was a pretty warm reception um, and I haven't gone uh, and checked out, I'm not quite sure how you would, how people received them, but I think that it was warmly received. That here was a story of a couple of generations earlier of this amazing woman, Anne Lister, who lived in Shipton Hall. And he did that for five years, publishing them weekly in the Halifax Guardian. And then 1892, he suddenly stopped and the diaries publication stopped. And I think what a, a lot of people know, and this is a kind of one of the most celebrated <laughs> episodes in the uh, Anlister history since her death, is that he was puzzling on the Anlister code, um, sitting in Shibden going, ah, oh, how do us, you do it work with, everything's wrong together and it's all these funny little signs and everything. And he was uh, having, bemoaning it to Arthur Burrell, who was a fellow antiquarian, who was a school master, uh, classics master, I think, at Bradford Grammar School nearby. And uh, Arthur Burrell thought he'd got two letters, H and E, and he came back to John Lister and they sat in Shibden late at night, puzzling out H and E, um, and uh, did eventually find out that was help in God is my hope. And with that, they could crack the rest of the code. Uh, but as everybody who's read uh, Presenting the Past knows, uh, when Arthur Burrell suggested that what was in the code was so scurrilous and dangerous and that the diaries should in their entirety be burnt, John Lister, being a scholar, a, a scholar and an intellectual, just couldn't do it. But the diaries seemed to have been put back behind their... Um, the secret panels at Shipton and there they remained for another 40 years and there was complete and absolute silence about Anne Lister. That's fascinating. Is there is there anything about the legal context of John Lister's time that you think is relevant to his choices about what to what to conceal or reveal? Yes, I think um, the 1885 Criminal Law Amendment Act is pretty important in two ways. It, it, it criminalised or it further criminalised more harshly male homosexual activity. It didn't touch women, it didn't affect women at all, but it was a sort of cultural context. It particularly affected John Lister, I think, because he was undoubtedly homo a homosexual man himself. So the passing of the 1885 law, and uh, I just worked out he was 38, so he's, when that came in, he was still sort of youngish. Uh, probably had left Oxford 15 or so years earlier, and I think it really did uh, affect him. Um, and it also meant, it meant the sort of culture of silence about homosexuality got fiercer. Okay, it didn't criminalise women in any way or affect women, but it meant a cultural context in which you could not discuss the kind of relationships with same-sex relationships that Anne Lister discusses so very vividly and candidly and in detail in her diary. And I think that's one of the reasons why this 40-year silence then prevailed. Uh, while, while it wasn't criminalised, there was an attempt, wasn't there? Yes, it's quite interesting. It's only fairly recently come to light. Um, and that was 1921, so we're jumping on quite a bit uh, further on. Um, um, John Lister is obviously much older by then. And this is three years after women, or most women aged 30, in Britain had won the vote, the right to vote in parliamentary elections. So there's a lot of confidence. Uh, anybody who's looked at suffrage history knows of the confidence that women had after 1918, that women over 30 could win the vote, and maybe all women over 21 before too very long. And some parliamentarians in the House of Commons and the House of Lords looked at these very confident women getting professions and getting uh, better pay and so on and so forth, having the vote and thought, uh, uh supposing, and they thought, they thought lesbianism, they suspected that lesbianism uh, was uh, in, on the advance and that there were more women uh, loving other women. And there was an attempt in Parliament, only an attempt, in 1921 to extend the Criminal Law Amendment Act from just male homosexual activity to include women. 
<laughs> it fell. It fell. It was a parliamentary attempt that sort of went like that and just fell down and never became law. And the reason why it didn't become law was some parliamentarians, I think this was in the House of Lords, said, you cannot get a, an action uh, and criminalise it, add it to the criminal code without naming it. You cannot say robbery is a crime without saying what robbery is. So you can't say that uh, sexual relationships between women is a crime and can be taken to court unless you name it. And knowledge is dangerous, the parliamentarians thought. And because knowledge in dan is dangerous and no man's marriage might be safe, uh, that was the thought. It fell pretty quickly. Um, and in fact, uh, les lesbian relationships weren't at all uh, criminalised or affected by legislation until much more recently, which we'll perhaps go on to a little bit later. Fascinating. So, but by not <laughs> naming it, we can prevent it from occurring. That's exactly, incredible. exactly. Yeah. So exactly. after after John's time at Chibden Hall and Chibden Hall becoming part of the local trust over the years, so. What brings on the next wave of research and interest in Anne Lister? Well, I th see John, John Lister died quite an elderly man in 1933, and I think quite a, an isolated, somber figure. If you see the photograph in Shibden um, with the fellow antiquarians, they look serious. He looks glum, and I think it, he really didn't have an easy, easy time of it. Um, as you say, Shibden Hall was then owned by Halifax Borough. And so the borough librarian, Edward Green, took responsibility. And his young daughter, Muriel Green, um, was uh, given the, the task of going into Shibden and sorting out this enormous mass of paper. I mean, you know how massive amount of paper that Anne Lister uh, produced. John Lister, similarly, you know, he, he dug into the archives, et cetera, et cetera. So she had an enormous job. And the only per other person in Shipton when young Muriel Green went there to sort out the papers um, was a live-in live constable, a live-in policeman to make sure that nothing was stolen. So she bravely went in and started to work on the Anne Lister, diary, on the Anne Lister letters. And she said to me much later on, reminiscing as an elderly woman, we didn't know much about the code then. Those sort of things weren't discussed then. So she didn't work on the, um, the, the diary. She worked on the letters and in 1938 produced a very, very useful and very impressive uh, librarian's dissertation on the Anne Lister letters. It's that thing. And if anybody is serious about Anne Lister research, it's worth getting a, a photocopy of that. Yeah, so it's a shame that Mira Green's work is now more widely read, and I know many are working to make it more accessible. So today, yeah. that the yeah. full work is currently only available in person at the local library, and it's typed up by hand. It's fantastic, yeah. um, and and Anne's letters are beautifully written, fascinating, and they com and if you compare and contrast the drafts with the letters, it's also a lot of interesting insights there. So hopefully, that's yeah. something that will become more accessible to people over time. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so there's that, there was that wave. So then media plays a role in new waves of interest. And so with the Guardian article, the two million word enigma in 1984, what were the repercussions? I don't think there were sort of public repercussions then. It's just a whole lot of us thought, hmm, um, that looks very interesting. Um, I just moved to Halifax, you know, just a couple of miles from Shipton four years earlier. I was busy teaching and I was busy writing a book about the history of Green and women and, and Green and Common Peace protest. So I didn't get uh, immediately involved. The person who did was, of course, Helena Whitbread, whose book, um, I Know My Own Heart, on the early analyst that came out in 1988. So just four years later. Yes, you have it. That's it. That's yeah. the one. That's the early edition. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and that had quite an impact. It was published by Virago and it was the first um, publication, first book that you can hold in your hand of um, Anne Lister's diary, including the code. It was the very first occasion. Um, so I was teaching in Halifax. I was teaching a New Opportunities for Women class and I included photocopies of the pages in my uh, it, it took them into the classroom and all my women said well no one told us we never knew that sort of thing went on he did have quite a 
And the following year, that came out in 1988, and then the following year, 1989, there was a Halifax Antiquarians Day School on Anne Lister. That's mm -hmm. a local uh, eminent local history uh, society which John Lister helped form in 1989 on the Anne Lister Diary. Helena Whitbread spoke and I just made a note, my note notes, blood on the Halifax Library carpet. Uh, it was held in the Halifax Library and people just had such strong opinions about what earlier editors had done and who had got the right to talk about Anne Lister and who didn't and what, how they were going to do it and I thought crikey there's more to this woman than meets the eye. And mm -hmm. the following year, I had time to start looking at the original diaries um, and taking some of those pages into my classroom. And of course, once you, once you have a taste of the analyst diaries and you can begin uh, deciphering the code yourself and working out what it's saying, it becomes very exciting. And my life, um, you know, when I wasn't actually teaching, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, from 1990 onwards was rather uh, shaped by Anne Lister because she had a, a grip on me. She had me in her clutches. So that, that's wonderful. And, and your experience of the diaries was to physically go to the archives and sit with them. Is that correct? No, no, no. Sadly, life's not like that. <laughs> if only we could go to the library, just the archives in the library and just hold the diaries. But they're supremely fragile. Um, and are so rare and so unique and fairly ancient that what people like me had to work with in the 1990s and is anybody listening mature enough to remember microfilm? <laughs> what you do with microfilm reels is go forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards um, and you, I, I work from uh, printouts from the microfilm which was fine that's, that's, that's a whole other layer of challenges on top of actually trying to understand and interpret what's written. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, can you speak a little bit about uh, any other researchers uh, at the time in the 80s? So I know uh, Vivian Ingham had started working towards her PhD on focusing on Endlister, and she also collaborated with Ramson. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Phyllis Ramston's an interesting person. She was very much part of the Halifax cultural elite. She was married, I think, to uh, the Halifax Courier newspaper owner um, and was an academic. She had her doctorate and she started working on the Anne Lister paper, Anne Lister diary, quite, quite soon after the war. Uh, mm -hmm. And by the 1980s, she'd written quite a few articles about Anne Lister's travels, which uh, anybody interested in the travels, you know, please read the Phyllis Ramsden articles in the archives, they're type, typewritten. And she also, uh, with Vivian Ingham, I think it was, worked on the coded sections, because of course by then, um, the uh, John, John, Lister, John Lister's key to the, he, John Lister's key to the code um, ha, had arrived in the library in the in the 1930s. Um, Arthur Burrell sent a copy of it, the key to the code, mm -hmm. to Edward Green, 1936-37, and said, "Dear Mr. Green, here is the copy of the key to the code that John Lister and I helped compile in the, around 1892. You have the only copy now. Please keep it under lock and key." It is quite dangerous. It would expose truths about um, some of the elite families in Halifax. Um, after the war, Phyllis Ramsden was able to use this key and she did a, a version herself and she summarized all the coded passages. And I've looked at the coded passages that she summarized, not all of them, many of them, and I've looked at her summaries and they're very accurate. They're very, very accurate. They're short and they're accurate. And the only way they can be accurate summaries is if she had uh, deciphered all the coded passages herself. And they're very difficult to decipher because of course all the words run together. Um, so you spend quite a bit of time trying to work out where one word ends and the next word begins. And what is the tragic tragedy about Phyllis Ramson? She'd done all this work on the travel, um, travel part of the diaries, which does survive in TypeScript, and her transcripts of the coded sections, which don't, as far as we know. 
and she died in 1985. So that was the year after the Guardian article, the two million word enigma. And none of her transcripts of the coded sections appear to survive. And the story I've been told, which is repeated, you know, repeated conversation, oral testimony, is that on her death in 1985, either she destroyed those transcripts of the coded passages shortly before her death, or in her will, she instructed her, uh, her immediate descendants, which I think was um, granddaughter, to, to burn them. But nobody's actually found them, which is just, what it tells you so much is what it was like to be gay, um, or write about a gay woman in this case, in Halifax, in a conservative town like Halifax, even as late as 1985. That, that is such an interesting context. I hope we, uh, we unearth some more information about, about yes. that context and learn a little bit more about uh, Ramson's experience there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to take a moment to uh, highlight another particular work that came after that period, which is Catherine Mueller's amazing PhD in 1995, which is a hefty volume um, titled Moving Bet Between Worlds, Gender, Class, Politics, Sexuality, and Women's Networks in the Diaries of Anne Lister of Shibden Hall, Halifax, Yorkshire, 1830-1840. Can you speak to that a little bit, Jill? Yes. I mean, the, 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 the D. Phil dissertation from York by Kat Euler is as impressive um, and weighty as the title. And I met, I had the privilege of meeting Kat Euler when she was a doctoral student at York. Um, it would be in the early 1990s or mid 1990s and we worked uh, quite closely together because we were the two people who were interested in the Anne Diaries in the 1830s when for both of us, Kat and myself, Anne Lister is, is at her most interesting, she is at her most powerful, she is at her most sort of polymath. Um, and uh, I don't think it's a thesis that I'd say was very easy to read, I don't know what you feel would you say that? Uh, it, it, it requires a lot of context that you might not have going into it. So it requires a reread after you go seek out that context. Yes, yes. What it is, uh, unlike, say, Helena's books on the early Anne Lister or mine on Anne Lister in the 1830s, uh, we approached the diary chronologically, uh, how she wrote it, what Pat, because she was doing a de Phil thesis for a university did, was thematic. So you, you're given the title and you can see the kind of themes of class and gender and sexu sexuality in women's networks. And it is a brilliant read. It's based it on, if I remember correctly, three years in the 1830s. She read the diary for 1832, wow, the diary for 1835 and the diary for 1837, the three election years. And you say, oh, I should only read three years. I mean, that in itself is a gargantuan task. Yes, and for anybody who's doing serious work, serious research on Anne Lister, please look at the Catherine Euler uh, doctoral thesis because it really is so impressive and so good. And she really does understand Anne Lister. And unlike the Muriel Green thesis, it's um, digital, it's available digitally. So you can do a word search, for example, which is just fantastic. Yeah, it's it's really remarkable work. Um, so, you you mentioned the 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 choice of approaching it thematically rather than chronologically. So, why would you make a choice like that as a researcher, and and how have you considered that as uh, yourself? Well, for me, um, everybody makes their own choices about how to approach the Amnesty Diary and how to present it. And for me, there was no choice. I just thought quite early on when I started doing my Anvista research in the early 1990s, I have to read this diary as Anvista wrote it. I'm not going to pull out the coded sections, tempting though it might be, and just focus on those and then come back to the uh, handwritten sections. Um, I'm going to read it, read it as she wrote it. And anybody who's looked at a page of the Anvista diaries knows that she goes through handwriting um, into code, then back to handwriting, then back to code, then back to handwriting in the space of a day, an hour, a couple of minutes. <laughs> I mean, quite phenomenal. And I think that, that sort of 
two, get, get, you know, she's writing with two eyes. One is a coded eye and one is a handwritten eye. And you, the whole Anlister for me, the complete Anlister, is that intermix of the coded sections, which about the areas of her life where she had to be fairly private, predominantly sexual relationships and emotional relationships with other women, but also equally embarrassing things like, uh, I'm running out of money. Um, my gloves need darning. I, by implication, I can't afford a, a new pair. Um, slightly embarrassing things, but mainly it's about her sexual relationships with other women, Marianna Lawton, and in the 1830s, from 1832 onwards, of course, Anne, Anne Walker. And I do feel that's how I will continue to want to read Anne, Anne Lister and to present Anne Lister. It's day by day as she lived her days. Hello? Liv, you've muted. Sorry, I muted myself, thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, about around 1998, uh, you came out with Female Fortune. So tell us a little bit about that context. Well, um, yes, I was really pleased to be able to have Female Fortune published, which was the Anlisa Diaries from 1833 to 1836, which sounds like it's only two and a half years, only two and a half years. She only wrote for X thousand, mm. tens of thousands of words. <laughs> um, and the response to that was very, very warm. And I got some really, really lovely reviews of people who were absolutely staggered that Anne Lister could do what she did, both uh, in terms of living a lesbian life, in this case with Anne Walker, with whom she had a, a marriage ceremony, not a marriage recognized by other church or the state, but a marriage ceremony in her eyes, and who was also at the same time politically active um, with Anne Walker in both the 1835 election and 1837 election. She would doorstep her tenants, their tenants, and say, you don't wish to um, dis displease your landowner, do you? Uh, you will give a blue vote. She couldn't actually say, or I'll quit you, but that was the implication. Mm -hmm. Plus, she was uh, industrially active, particularly um, commercially active, economically active, particularly in terms of coal mining. So everybody <laughs> was rather sort of amazed that Anne Lister, who they thought had just had romantic relationships with a whole series of women, was continuing doing that, but also politically involved, intellectually, very, very wide, ranging. I mean, what she read everything from sort of uh, geology to science to languages. Uh, ever faced by a, a trip to Germany, she'd start learning German. What was the problem? Um, and one of the very nice things, as well as the reviews to Female Fortune, was that um, Sally Wainwright, who at that stage I didn't know, got in touch with me via a mutual friend um, who had given Sally a copy of Female Fortune as a present. And Sally was completely bowled over by this account of a woman who'd lived not far from where she grew up. Um, she grew up in Sorby Bridge, which is only five miles or so from, from Halifax. And we did eventually meet through this mutual friend, which was very nice. And Sally was then a, an emerging scriptwriter for television, working on soaps like um, Coronation Street. I don't know whether you get that in America. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> Coronation Street, you know, learning her trade, as it were. And she was very keen to write a, dr a dramatic script for the BBC um, on Anne Lister and the relationship with Anne Walker and et cetera, et cetera. But, and we, we spent a lot of time walking around Shibden and visiting the houses that Anne Lister knew and um, thinking of script ideas, my feeding research in Sally uh, responding with her, her creative ideas. But sadly, the time wasn't ripe at that stage for the BBC to say yes. Um, I went back to uh, my first love, which was Votes for Women and, and writing Rebel Girls, etc., etc. And Sally, with far more aplomb and chutzpah, went and wrote um, amazingly successful television dramas, including Lost Tango in Halifax and Happy Valley, but didn't give up on Anne Lister, did not give up on Anne Lister, and 14 years later, pretty much 14 years later, when we were almost just on Christmas card terms, as you are, she got back in touch again via this mutual friend and we started working again on uh, Gentleman Jack, as it was soon to become. 
and uh, the rest is history, I think. Yes, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, in terms of timing, and of course, Sally has, has been trying to make this happen and then she finally did it and, and has really opened up and listened to a whole new audience of people. Uh, yeah. and, and in I addition I to just, that, I'll go ahead. I, just, I could just add that by the time Sally approached the BBC or the production company approached the BBC and it was by that stage about 2016, she was so seriously uh, acclaimed and recognized as a script writer. She was an award-winning script writer that the BBC, instead of saying, mm, said, uh, when would you like to start? Like, completely different. Sorry, I interrupted. Exactly. I mean, she, 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 she took the endless her route. Like, she, she'll make it happen, she, whatever it takes. It took some years, but she got exactly. there. Yeah. Um, so what I was what I was speaking to is you know as as a very broad new global audience became aware of Anne Lister through through Gentleman Jack thanks to Sally, um, another thing happened in terms of the diaries which is the digitization of the diaries and making that available. So thanks to the West Yorkshire Archive Services, we now all have access and we don't have to uh, experience the diaries the way you experienced the diaries when you first yeah. conducted your research. Uh, which is a whole new landscape for, for folks who are interested in, in understanding and Lister. Um, so rather than the physical access to the library, we have the ability to, uh, you know, access them directly wherever we are. Um, so how has this last wave, do you feel, been different? And what do you think that means for what's next in and Lister research? Um, it's a big question, and I'll try to give a fairly short answer. Um, there had been publicity um, and films and radio and so on, um, television about um, the Amnesty Diaries, really through the 1990s and uh, after 2000. Um, and that, both for Helena Whitbread and myself, meant our, our books met, met, reached a, a slightly wider readership. But nothing, nothing, nothing prepared us for 2019 and Sally Wainwright's Gentleman Jack because if I had to pick on one factor, it wasn't just Sally Wainwright and the BBC and eight one hour episodes for this amazing drama, series one. It was also, and I'd never come across this before, this was completely new to me, it was HBO, which I now know is Home Box Office which is a bit like Netflix, but we never heard of, people in Britain have never heard of HB what? HBO. And what that meant is that um, the Anne Lister, reader, Anne Lister diary readership and the, and the fan base, um, Anne Lister Gentleman Jack fans, is now, you know, it's fair enough to call it global. Um, I've been contacted by people in the States, of course, in Europe, of course, but also Western Australia, Brazil. Um, somebody uh, asked for some signed copies of my Anlister books from the Philippines. I mean, it's almost every single country you could come, come across. Perhaps Africa slightly less so as yet. So global, a global impact. That's great. Um, so uh, we're about time. So I want to give everyone an opportunity to ask questions if they have. The way we're going to do this is you click on your participant panel and you touch raise hand if you like to ask a question and I'll call on you to unmute yourself, ask your question and remute yourself. Um, so to let's see if, you, if anybody is interested in asking a question, this is the time to raise your hand and I will call on you. Um, just as a, as a parting thought for that, uh, Joe, uh, do you see any disadvantages with this new wave uh, or openness uh, in, in access to Enlister? Well, I don't think there's any real advantages that outweigh the advantages, but I suppose it, it's quite hard for people who've seen Gentleman Jack um, and seen the Sally Wainwright's portrayal of, in particular, the Anne Lister and Anne Walker relationship and how unusual it was and how brave it was on, on both their parts. Um, and want fairly quick results to find then they're looking at a page of the diary um, and particularly the very difficult handwritten sections of the diary, which are the bulk of it, it's at least five, six. It varies a bit from decade to decade. 
Um, and you might think that the code is quite difficult to read, but it's not once you've got either John Lister or Phyllis Ramsden's key to the code in your hand, it's, you can work it out. But the handwritten sections of the diary, which as I say are the bulk, are very, very difficult because um, Anne Lister's, uh, she abbreviated everything. So Liddy Stir, people said, emailing me, who's Liddy Stir? I said, it's Lady Stewart. Or <laughs> uh, somebody saying, what are DWs? What's DWs? And I said, it's day's work. It's similar to, but uh, smaller than and an acre and um, all her abbreviations are sort of very very um, off-putting so for ing like seeing uh, it's a, a horizontal a figure on its side um, and it really does take a lot of time to get your eye in so <clears throat> I hope people will persevere and produce uh, some more endless to research and yeah that's great Fantastic. So, all right. So let's jump into some questions. I will first say that I, I am sure there are questions about how can we get a hold of Jill's books. And especially if you're in a location where you might have a hard time getting access to the physical books, when is a digital version of uh, Female Fortune available? And I know Jill is working on that. So we're going to skip those questions. But you can always go to Jill's website. And as soon as that digital version is available, I will be sure to let everyone know. Uh, but I will jump into questions now. First question is coming from Jenna Bayer. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Jill. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned at the beginning um, that there's this idea that um, John Lister was also uh, gay and that might have been influencing how he was interpreting things and stuff. And I was just wondering where that idea came from, like what evidence there is that he was also a gay man. Um, an interesting question. Um, to which I can't, I'm afraid, give a very satisfactory answer. Um, there are little signs in some of his writings at the time um, of implications that some relaxation activities were illicit, uh, illegal, bad. Um, there was oral testimony passed down in Halifax of how he had a relationship with a younger man etc etc nearby um, so it's difficult to of course it's difficult because it was criminalized harshly criminalized so he's not going to be leave uh, an archive trail behind in this but I think there's enough to suggest that is very very lightly and I always, when I'm talking about John Lister and his sexuality, always say it is very likely, it is very probable. Certainly there, so that's where I put his, my money. But of course, you're not going to find documented, a, a documentary trail that we'd all like to find. It's just not there. He wasn't that kind of person. It wasn't that kind of time. It was harsher and harder after 1885 when he was doing his work. Sorry. Uh, next question comes from Anne Boyens. And please unmute yourself, ask your question. Hi, Jill. Thanks for that. That was a that was a great talk. Just curious, really. Do you yourself plan to do any further research and writing about any aspect of Anderson's life? Um, I mean, the three books you've done are amazing, uh, very comprehensive, and wonderful context. But I just wondered, given the interest, given your work, have you further plans? Well, it's. I mean, certainly, Anderson is extremely compelling, and it's difficult to. Uh, to give up on that. Um, I'd certainly be very interested to do further work. Um, and I think there's still so much more to do. And what, what the Analyst of Code Breakers have done, um, which has started off with a transcript of the complete diaries, because there are gaps between, say, and they've done the very early years now, and I think they've actually, that's been up online, hasn't it, over the last few weeks um, that they've done the first few years. But of course, as the years progress and Anne Lister gets more serious and, and more interesting, more complex, the diaries get longer. Um, there's still quite a sort of chunk of years between when Helena's second book ends and uh, Nature's Domain 
Um, my book, Nature's Domain, starts mm. in 1832. If anybody feels they've got a, uh, a few spare years to spend <laughs> researching and deciphering the late 1820s, that would be absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Anne. Uh, next question comes from Sukatash Lindsay. Sukatash, can you please unmute yourself? Hi, Jill. Thanks for Hi. speaking. Um, I've enjoyed every talk I've ever uh, seen of yours. I'm wondering, um, thinking about this idea of putting things in context, if you know um, if the scrap of paper that had In God is My Hope still exists, or did any of the early researchers write anything more about its context, more specifically where it was found, uh, what they thought it was, um, any sort of explanation for it? Well, I have been asked this question before, and I can see why people are interested in this scrap of paper that Arthur Burrell refers to, In God is My Hope. But I really don't think, my, my suggestion would be, don't worry about it. It could be any scrap of paper. It happened to be In God is My Hope. I mean, that, the Shipton Hall archives are, I can't show it on the screen, but my hands are going out and out and out and out, far beyond the screen. I've seen them in the archives, shelf after shelf after shelf. And you can just imagine that um, before Halifax Borough took them over, how these bits of paper and scraps of paper and Anister's sections of paper were all over the place in, in Shipton or spilling out from one pile to the next. And it just happened to be the scrap of paper that Arthur Burrell found. I think it could be any, any uh, scrap of paper that gave them the clue, um, because you could guess what, that hope was the word, that how to crack the code. Uh, and to be honest, I think that's all it is. But I'm happy to be persuaded otherwise. People feel it's a really significant scrap of paper. Does that mean that Anne commonly wrote in code outside of her journal on other scraps of paper as well? Um, it seems she did. Yes, it seems she did. Or um, I mean, she was such a prolific writer. Um, and to write in God is my hope would be a very typical and this uh, uh, comment, and particularly when times were hard for her, as they were in the period I studied in the 1830s, they were quite hard for her at time, and she was indomitable in her spirit. But it, what helped her, uh, besides her, her sense of uh, uh, social class and uh, belonging to the landed gentry, and so a sense of uh, social class entitlement, what helped her was her belief in God. And she was a very firm and fervent uh, Anglican member of the Church of England. And uh, she would often appeal to God. Uh, um, and she knew God had created her nature and therefore God wanted her to be as she was, to love women and not to love men. Thank you for that Hello? question, Sukhatash. Um, I, um, I don't see any Hello? other questions. Livia. Can you hear me? Livia. Oh. Hello? Hello? Can you hear us, Jill? Yes. Okay, I think we had a little hiccup. Um, Do you want to say that bit again? Uh, I was just saying thank you for the question. It does, oh, it looks like we have one last question from Allison. Allison, please unmute yourself. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, so, Jill, I think it's fascinating that you got to speak with Muriel Green. And it looks like Catherine Euler might still be alive. I'm wondering if you've had any interaction with her and if she's involved at all in, in current analyst research. Well, yes, I did very much enjoy the interview with Muriel Green. Um, and I, did really enjoy, I did really enjoy the interview with Muriel Green. Um, this was in the early 1990s and it was absolutely fascinating to talk to somebody and their memories of what it was like to go into Shipton Hall just days after John Lister had died. Uh, Kat Euler, I met in the 1990s when she was a student at York. She was obviously um, is American. And she went back quite soon. She got a teaching job after her DPhil at Sunderland University, if I remember rightly. And then obviously all her family was in the States. So she went back to the States quite early on. Um, and the last, I've, last contact I've made with her is from the University of Arizona 
um, where she's certainly been active, and this is going back 15 or 20 years, I think, maybe 15 years, 20 years, um, but neither Livia nor I have been able to find signs of her, uh, and it's just on the website, the university website, or any um, Googling of what she's been doing in terms of Alistair. I don't think she's written or published anything about Alistair, which is a great shame because I would certainly read with much great relish anything that Kat Euler wrote because I think her understanding of how complex a character Alistair was and how she, for example, um, judged how women could be useful to her in terms of their social rank. So she liked to write to women, women friends who'd got titles and uh, unfortunately Mariana Lawton didn't have a title and nor did Anne Walker. So I really, <laughs> whereas Lady Bea Cameron or Lady Stuart de Rosse or Lady etc etc etc, that was a very different matter. Um, so I'm sorry I can't help you but if anybody does manage to make contact with um, Kat Eula in Arizona or thereabouts, I know Livia and I would love to hear. Yeah, we, we tried very hard. We really wanted her to join us at the summit this time, but I have not given up and hopefully by next time uh, she'll be able to, to be with us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, this has been lovely. Thank you all for your questions. Jill, thank you so much for taking the time. I hope you have a wonderful vacation. Um, and uh, uh, next up, we're going to have uh, Digging Through the Archives and How to Manage Your Research Mess, which is a great uh, transition from uh, contextualizing all of the historical research that we've had so far. Uh, so thank you, everyone. We'll see you all soon. Bye. Thank you very much, Livia. That was lovely. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you.